Welcome to the Kindness Warrior Podcast. I'm your host, Carly Riggs, and this is a special episode of our show. It is a recording of a virtual parent education session that Down Center of Louisville recently hosted. This session was led by Zach Sappenfield and Brianna Heitzman, who are two of our career solutions specialists. Say that three times fast. Um, in this session, they break down how important it is to utilize chores in your household to ensure future success in the workplace. So this session was done on Zoom. So please keep in mind that they are looking at a PowerPoint and they might refer to a photograph here and there. Um, but for you, our listeners, we have attached the PowerPoint in the show notes if you would like to take a look at it. So I really hope you enjoy developing responsibility, teaching job skills at home. You are listening to the Kindness Warrior Podcast, a Down Syndrome of Louisville production, serving locally, sharing globally. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Brianna Heitzman. I'm one of the supported employment specialists at Down Syndrome of Louisville. Um, today, we're going to be talking about developing responsibility, um, learning job skills, and work, work ethic at home. Um, we are really excited about having you guys this morning. We have just a few things that we would like for you guys to get out of the program today. Um, we're going to be doing an introduction, why work is important, how we work together, and ideas for getting started. Um, we're going to talk about what Career Solutions is, uh, what, what we provide as customized employment. Um, we are Mark Golden Associate. Um, Jesus, I can't even think now. We're Mark Golden Associate um, certified, um, and we are certified employment support professionals. So we have our um, we have our documentation to say that we do customized employment. Um, this is our team. Uh, this is Kristen and Shelly and Zach and myself. Um, there are four of us. And um, Kristen does long-term support. And then Zach and I do um, customized employment and long-term support. Um, this is some of our uh, group that we work with. Uh, several of our members are in long-term jobs, have, have worked for more than uh, six years in their jobs. Um, if you have questions about what they do or where they work, just please feel free to ask us. Um, we'll be more than happy to let you know about um, what they do and how long they've been at their jobs. Why does employment matter? And this gives um, our people, our individuals and adults um, independence in the community it's, uh, it gives them a contribution to society and it's advocating for oneself. Um, it is very important that our members have a role in society. Um, it is the most um, important role. Um, we talk about a social role valorization and it is a huge deal for people with disabilities. Um, people see them as eternal children. And when we um, put them into a role in society, it helps people see that they are um, not eternal children, but that they can contribute to society just like a non-disabled peer. Um, they are able to earn their own money. They're able to make new friends. They're able to develop confidence and additional skills. After school. Um, after school, we usually meet people right after high school or at whatever vocational training they may have. Um, and then that's when we start working with them. Um, we provide services at that point. Um, we, we, begin the OBR process. A variety of factors will influence their job readiness, 
which is speech coordination, reading, number recognition, handling money, and the biggest one of all, chores. Chores. An individual who works at home and already has an established work ethic will always do better than those who don't. Um, we have seen this firsthand um, with many of our members. Uh, when we have members who do chores at home, they have such a better work ethic um, when it is time for them to get a job. And we have seen that uh, with a particular client uh, that was homeschooled and did um, functional skills at home. And she was so ready for work when it came time um, to do, uh, when, when it came time for, to look for a job. So she had all the skills she needed to find a job. Um, Margarita, we're gonna ask you a few questions now. Okay. <laughs> all right. Mine wasn't homeschooled, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna give, I, or do you wanna give a little bit of background about Austin? Well, Austin is 25 years old, very independent. He's, um, <laughs> I'd, I'd say maybe we're going through our teenage years now because I get a lot of the rolling eyes and I've got this mom, I guess, where I try to over help. Mm -hmm. So I, I get told to step back quite a bit, which is good. It's a good thing. But he has a brother and a sister that are three and four years older than him, which has probably been the biggest help because whatever they did, he thought he could do too. They always started out with jobs. You know, we live on a farm and I worked full time at that time when the kids were little and I had to have help. So, I mean, they had their jobs as far as household doing loading and unloading the dishwater, washer, feeding the animals, you know, getting their laundry downstairs and to the machine. Some of them did laundry, but as long as it got to the, in the right hamper, you know, that was the good part. Here he comes down the steps now and hears me talking about him. So, <laughs> but he is, he is a very independent. Come on around here, bud. He is a very independent little, a young person, I should say. He's not much little anymore. Say hi to Brianna. Hi, Brianna. Hi, Austin. <laughs> so I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you just a few questions. Margaret. Sure. Um, just simply because we know um, Austin was ready to get a job when it was time for him to get a job. Was. And he was prepared for that. Um, why did you start teaching Austin to do chores? Well, with any of your children, downs or typical or anything, you don't want to limit them as far as, well, you're never going to be able to do that. You're never going to be able to do that. You know, hopefully the legal stuff, that's what you want to say. But for the, you know, life skills, you want all of your children to be able to do that. And Austin didn't think of himself as any different than anybody else. So therefore he was ready. He never complained. He jumped in. Okay. His Andrew and Amy were doing this. So he needed to do this too. And it was just, wasn't really a thought process. It just, this is how we do it. I mean, this is everybody has a, a part to play in the family and he, he was a part of it. And, you know, just because he had down syndrome and we didn't do the poor Austin, he can't do this Poor Austin. Don't make him do that. He was expected to have a part in the family. And that meant doing the jobs that we need to do. So, I mean, it, I can't think that I sat down and thought, well, he's going to have to have a job to do. It just, it just did it. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> was it important for Austin um, to do chores and why? Of course well, it was because it gives him a sense of ownership, you know, like the chores that he does. Yeah. Somebody else might be able to do it faster, but is that really the point? You know, just he's, he's getting better at doing things. He, takes responsibility. I don't have to say, Austin, you need to do this. He sees it's time to load or unload the dishwasher. He gets it done. He goes and gets the mail every day. He gets his U of L Cardinal gloves on and goes and gets the mail for us, which for us is it's a good little walk. 
He brings the trash can up. I mean, all of these are jobs he feeds the animals. This is jobs that he does and he takes responsibility for and he's proud of this. He feels, I'll get it out. He feels, can you just turn the oven off? Yeah. Can he, he just feels like a part of it. I mean, like he's not any different. He's a grown up, you know, he'll, he's quick to tell you, I'm 25. I'm not a teenager anymore, right. but he is, you know, everything that everybody else does, he feels the need to do too. And if it's up to me, if I can help him to do that, then that's what we'll do. I mean, he fixes his own breakfast. Yes, I could probably fix it quicker, but that's not the point again. He can do what he wants to do. He gets his tasks done in the morning and that's him. He has a little independence. I know I can trust him if I've got to leave the house for an hour or so, that's, that's plenty, that he's going to do all right and not burn the house down, not going to, he won't answer the door. He doesn't answer the telephone in the house. He's got his own cell phone, which he's very responsible with. Right, right. And it just, I think having chores brings, you know, a sense of pride and you do feel responsible. You do. And if you feel responsible, then I think you are responsible. Um, how did you go about teaching Austin to do chores? Like I said, his brother and sister were right above him and he followed suit. Whatever they did, he did. It's just a matter of watching and he does what you do. And it's just, it's not really been you know, sometimes it just takes showing him one time what to do if it's something new. If we're, He helps me out. Like I said, we have a farm, and I have a couple of guys that work for us on the farm, and we have a big lunch every day. And he's a great big help with that. He helps get the table set, get the drinks, the iced tea, lemonade, whatever made. He does all that. And it's just... Yeah, I mean, he takes care of making sure that everything is done. If I've had to be away right before lunch, I know he's going to get that done without me even having to tell him. I had a dentist appointment the other morning and I, did, I was pushing it to get back in time for lunch. They were right here on the farm and they were coming in and I said, well, did you set the table? He said, the table's already set. So, I mean, it was just a matter of he watches what I do and what anybody else does and this is what he does. I mean, he's, his dad was here one day when I had to be gone after supper. I got him sat down and I had to leave. And his dad said he cleaned the whole table up. He put everything away. He, you know, wiped the table down. He just, and it's not something I've said, this is what you do, but he's watched what I do. And it's just something he's just done. I mean, I don't know. I can't really say that we've had a sit down lesson. It's just being in the middle of it every day involved. And this is what he does. So. Thank you, Margarita. We appreciate it. Thank you, You're Austin. Welcome. Thank you, Queen. <laughs> <laughs> Great job, Austin. We love you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Miss <Michelle. laughs> Um, Something we talk a lot about is how we see our members when they have a disability compared to how we see typical members and how our expectations and dreams for their lives change. Uh, Bree mentioned the issue, um, especially in the Down syndrome world, where our members are seen as children for their whole lives, um, sometimes as referred to as a holy innocent that can never do wrong. But when we look at them that way, we're not giving them their fair shake. We're not giving them all the opportunities that they have um, in our society. So a lot of times we'll say, parents will say, you know, well, they're not gonna be able to do this and this in their life where you know we want people to see a person who's growing up like anybody else who will have the same opportunities in life such as being independent having a job they like having healthy relationships with others and that's kind of the focus of um definitely our department and career solutions but also the bigger picture <clears throat> for down syndrome of louisville let's get these people to have the fullest life possible and let's analyze where we're holding them back and you can see little micro transgressions at times um people don't need their clothing put on for them or people don't need to be told what movies they can or can't see sure you know we have some guidance but we're also talking about adults here and we need to be allowing them to you know make decisions and have as independent a life as they can 
So the focus becomes a lot on, you know, what can this person do? Um, and this is in our non-traditional instruction class. This was one of the students I was working with. And you can see there, he was, you know, we were working on writing the letter B and he's getting there. But what he can do is he can hold a marker and draw and he can also unpack his entire lunch. And so as job coaches, we focus more on the vocational skills of what can this person do. And one of the benchmarks for that is can a person feed themselves? And usually somebody can. And the way that they feed themselves can be indicative of how they're going to work. But, you know, this young man, he could unpack his entire lunch. He could open up all the little, you know, containers that had different food in them. He could put them away and he could help me clean up. So those are the kind of things we look for. Um, the photograph on the right, the gentleman is Mark Gold, the one on the left there with the sideburns. And he was the first one to say, you know, don't bother with um, assessing vocational skill levels. If you're not familiar, a vocational skill test is a long checklist, you know, can this person do this or that? And it's exhaustive and it doesn't really help that much. But you know, what we can do is train somebody to do a job. And his family had a um, bicycle factory. And so what he set about doing was teaching somebody how to assemble a bicycle handbrake. And it's not that difficult once you get used to it, but it does involve nine parts. But he could teach somebody hand over hand how to assemble one of these things. And then all of a sudden you have a trained employee. And so if the idea is through instruction, if somebody can do this, then they have a job for their life. You know, they can go in, that'll be a part of their routine, and then they're making a contribution. And like Brianna was talking about for the advocacy level, somebody who's out working is demonstrating that, yes, they have a place in the world. So as Brianna also mentioned, we notice the people who are most well prepared when they get to adulthood have done lots of chores at home. And so they have a practical skill set. And so when we're looking for jobs for them, we can advertise and sell this person and say, you know, these are all the chores that they've done and they know how to work and they're coming to you with a skill set. Um, we're big believers that we're only as good as our training. That goes for everybody and everything. We had to be trained in this job. Um, you're trained on how to use computers, pretty much any job you're going to go into, there's going to be a level of training involved. But that is the foundation for our work readiness. And it has a big impact on what kind of a job a person can get. Okay. There's lots of lists like this out there online. Um, and we just kind of assembled a few of them. But benefits of doing chores are fairly straightforward. Margarita mentioned, you know, people believe they're capable of doing things. Um, workers learn that there's consequences if chores don't get done. People develop a sense of responsibility in taking care of oneself and the family. Um, you saw with Austin's involvement with his family and getting lunch ready. Um, you're going to develop empathy from taking care of other people. It's going to help build self-esteem because they have their place and they have their jobs that they're responsible for them. And in the midst of this, you're gonna learn problem solving skills because as we know, work doesn't always go smoothly. And you know, problems are gonna come up and you're gonna to have to think on your feet to get around those. Also, you're going to have a delayed gratification and a sense of pride. So not everything's going to you know, drop a sticker on you or give you a piece of candy or something you know, when you complete it. You're going to have pride that the table is set and that you're, you know, contributing to something larger than yourself. You're definitely going to learn about family and community and working together. Um, you're going to develop your motor skills. And when you're working in a larger setting, like if you're volunteering somewhere or you're working at a place of employment, you're going to have the opportunity to connect with other people that you normally wouldn't. You're going to make your own work friends and meet new people, perhaps interact with the public. We can also add, this wasn't from our article, this was from our experience. You learn what you actually enjoy doing when you're doing chores. I figured out um, when I had my first car, there was nothing I loved more than spending three hours waxing and detailing the whole thing. So it just looked perfect. And, you know, I could get lost doing that. And so I always thought, you know, 
I could wind up having a job as a car detailer because I really enjoy making everything look perfect. Developing a work ethic is really big. Um, just being able to sit or stand and do something. We've seen, you know, like we said, we've seen lots of good people come through who have a skill set and they can work already. We've also seen people who, for whatever reason, haven't done chores in their life. And so you have to start basically from the ground with them. Um, this is why we're working. This is what we're doing together. And that can happen for a number of reasons. But it's always better if people come to us being able to do work. And you're also going to grow through early defiant behaviors. People saying, I don't want to do something or, you know, maybe creating some kind of opposition. But that, that's always going to be a part of growing up and you just kind of have to work through it. Okay. This was the best article that we found regarding how to actually do work with your kids. And it was a scholarly article. The whole thing was put together by Micheline DeClef, who writes for National Public Radio. And they assembled a bunch of articles about how families in rural Mexico and South America work with their kids. And even though it's a different culture, and this is primarily geared towards toddlers, I think the ideas still translate. Um, he just, this is more about how they approach doing work together. But I think we'll see it's not that different than what um, Austin's family is doing. Okay, psychologists noticed in rural Mexican and South American communities how the children would talk about the chores that they did. A girl ran up to this um, researcher and said, you know, I wash my own clothes and there was pride involved. This was, you know, this is how I contribute. And her sister, you know, went up to her and said, I wash my clothes and my baby brother's clothes. And mind you, this is not in the washing machine. This is most likely in a hot water tub with a washboard and then the clothes are, you know, like hang out to dry. Suzanne Gaskins would say many times the children would ask to do work with that around the house to be involved with what you know the adults and the other family members were doing and this is all without gold scars without allowance or any other kind of incentive that they have it was common to see children working in unison with the adults dividing responsibilities so that all the work in the house was complete it's kind of like how Austin's contributing with his family. And the Spanish term they have for this is a comedido. It's really a complex term. It's not just doing what you're told and it's not just helping out. It's knowing the kind of help that is situationally appropriate because you're paying attention. And this is the kind of place you want your team to get to. People don't have to be asked to do things. People will step up and volunteer to help because they see that it's needed. They had examples when a mom would come home exhausted from work and the kids would help accomplish the rest of the tasks that needed to be done without being told. So our question is, you know, what are these families doing differently than some Western families? I'm definitely not gonna say all of them. And the researchers were saying, you know, you embrace the power of the toddler when they're young. So if you're doing a task like, making an omelet, have somebody come help and break eggs open or help some, have somebody come help and stir, even if it gets kind of messy. Um, totters are very eager to be helpful and children have an intrinsic motivation to help and extrinsic rewards seem to undermine it. Doing things with other people makes them happy and is important for their emotional development in the communal kind of sense. They see what their mom or siblings are doing and they want to do it. And they acknowledge that while toddlers are willing to help, we know that they can be messy and they won't be able to do a lot on their own. But instead of focusing on what they can't do, let's focus on what they can do. The researchers were talking about, we have lots of mothers, and this is very relatable, tell us things like, I need to do the chore quickly, and if my toddler tries to help, he makes a mess. So I'd rather do it myself than have them helping, which totally understandable. And, you know, there's going to be situations, of course, like, oh, we have people coming over at noon, I need to get all this stuff done. But they're saying, you know, try to take time to do things together and set a period of your day aside for that. Yeah, Zach, that's what Margarita was talking about, too. You know, she said that she could do things faster than Austin, but she allowed him to do them because 
the whole point is that he learns to do them. Right. So. Um, the families that the psychologists were talking to tried to expose their toddlers to as many chores as possible. And they invite them over by saying something to the effect of, come, we're going to go do the dishes now, or let's go sweep the floor together. And so that the toddler is introduced to the chores that they're doing while they're doing them. Um, one mom told him, yes, it is messy. When my toddler was doing dishes at the beginning, the water was all over the place, but I would allow him to do the dishes because this is how he learned. And I also like this, Zach, because it, it not just the kid or the child doing it, the whole family was doing it. The whole family was involved in it. It's right, not everybody just, went. Yes, it's not just one person doing it. <clears throat> yeah, and these opportunities to collaborate with parents sets off developmental trajectory that leads to children voluntarily helping at home. So early on, the toddler or you know young person is helping to work, but that develops later on into them being able to do something independently. On the other hand, if a child's told they're not involved in this activity, they're going to believe you and think, well, that's just not my place and I'm not going to be a part of that. And a question came up. So if this is a completely different culture, does this even apply to us? And this professor who I liked because he, he actually wrote me back, said, you know, replicating this isn't easy. It's not a slam dunk. We have to slow down what we were doing and we have to make allowances. And I think his idea was, um, you're not going to be able to just point and tell somebody to go do something and they're gonna go do it. You have to allow for this to be inefficient and be a little slower. Um, take the time to work with somebody so they can grow that way. It's, but as Marita pointed out, and we have some other examples, this is totally applicable to Western culture. We're still doing work at home. We just want to make it more of a team approach and doing it as efficiently and quickly as possible. A couple other examples that I ran into, Amish and Mennonite communities obviously raise their kids to work. And a lot of the work is done on gender lines, but it doesn't have to be. Typically, you know, the men and boys will go work in the fields or go do construction and the women will make clothes and cook and, you know, make jam and that kind of thing. But we don't have to follow those boundaries. Um, families living in agricultural communities, like, you know, the Edelins have a farm. I called a friend just last night to ask him about this because I knew we were doing this presentation. <laughs> and he was talking about butchering animals and they did that since they were in kindergarten. This young man I worked with um, when I was teaching fourth grade and he did a lot of work around his farm and he would come back with stories about painting the barn together and how his brother got all this paint on himself. But when they went to go work together, the grandfather, the father, Hunter and his brother all went together to do work. And by the time he was 10, he was so responsible. You could say, Hunter, I need you to go fix this fence paint this barn and feed the pigs and you'd shake his hand and you wouldn't see him again until it was all done. So our parent teacher conference was great. You know, his academics were fine, but I was like, I love what you did with this student because he's so, you know, reliable now. And now we're going to talk about how, you know, the specifics of how we go about doing this, even if you don't have a toddler, even if you're introducing a young person, you know, just to basic chores around the house. The first step, of course, is make sure that the kids are exposed to chores as much as possible. We want to give the children an opportunity to wander over and watch what is happening with adults. So don't, you know, put the kids aside with an iPad, you know, just like, you guys stay occupied while I go do this. Um, it's surprising how much toddlers can learn by simply observing what you do without lecturing or without explaining. And you're going to want to start out with smaller tasks that lead to larger contributions. Um, so like we said with, you know, here, come over and crack this egg or here, help me wash out this pot. You're going to want to offer opportunities for the child to help with the chore that you're doing. You give them a small task that is appropriate for their skill level. Maybe it's holding a measuring cup while baking, moving a chair while sweeping, or drying a dish or two. 
Um, and they were specific about having them not do mock work, like pretending to sweep or pretending to cook because they'll eventually figure out I'm not really doing anything. Where instead you can help, they can have them help you make little contributions to, you know, the work that you're doing. Your goal is to always work together. And we know that's not always gonna be the case. There's time restraints, um, but a motivating factor for children is being around the family and working on a common goal. Kind of like if you would go on a picnic together or go fishing together or something. But this motivation is lost if we divide up chores so everyone is working solo. An example is if you're folding laundry, make sure that everyone is folding everyone's laundry, as opposed to, you know, we're going over here, you guys clean the kitchen, we're doing this and this, which you may get to, but um, the big idea is working together. They also talked about not forcing the issue, especially when we're talking about younger people. Just like adults, don't, kids don't like to be bossed around. Asking a kid, could you come help me with this, often gets them on board much more than saying, you must do this. And I'm a big believer in this. This is just about you know, communication and being a part. It's really hard to say no when somebody, will you come help me wash the car? Will you help me fix this deck? As opposed to saying, you know, you go do this when the child may have no idea what you're talking about. And then, you know, you might get aggravated because it's not done the way you want. You start micromanaging and everybody winds up unhappy. Okay, we're also going to change our mindset about young children. And I'd also say in the same breath, changing your mindset about people with a disability. Um, all parents are interested in supporting their kids. But if you make the assumption the toddler wants to help you, but he doesn't have a good understanding of how to do that, then you'll try to find a way for him to help. You'll help him be a part of the activity. Okay. All right. There was another article that we went, we went through and it talked about um, developing skills for um, individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, the article was by Becca, Becca Eisenberg, um, and it was called The Asha Leader. Um, in this article, that she states that, that she's worked with several older adults and children with developmental disabilities without any experience in vocational skills. She goes on to say that individuals can complete tasks but lack the experience to. And she expresses that many individuals have not had the encouragement at home to learn basic chores. Um, Eisenberg gives a list of five chores to try at home with her with your children um, and gives in each one of these um, different skills that you can use um, for helping with these skill or helping with these um, chores. Laundry was one and you could do uh, categorization, following directions, literacy, reading the words in the care tags, math skills, detergent amounts, problem solving, and sequencing. She also said that there would be filing, you could do filing at home, such as taxes, instructional manuals, photos, warranties, and receipts, and that using following methods, categorization, literacy, following directions, expanding vocabulary and sequency were some of the skills that you could use for filing. Preparing food. Preparing food is always a good chore that you can use and you can do with your children um, or your adults. Sequencing, literacy, expanding vocabulary, articulation, math skills, describing and um, commenting, action, uh, actions, answering WH questions, um, problem solving, turn taking, and recalling information were all um, skills and um, academic skills that you could use that would help with preparing food. Recycling was another uh, chore that you could do that involved categorizing categorizing and gave uh, the skill of future job. Setting the table, that was something that Austin does um, and that gives uh, the skill of following directions, problem solvings, will you need spoons for dinner, will you need knives for dinner, 
where did the spoons and the knives and the forks go? And sequencing, do plates go first and then next goes what? Um, those were all things that you would need. Why are chores important? Um, chores are so important, guys. It gives the skills that um, our, our adults need to learn how to do jobs. These were fine examples of just small ways that you can do beginning uh, that you can begin helping your children at home learn skills to do chores, but often not just skills for chores. As you can see, chores lead to other skills such as problem solving, sequencing, and categorizing, all of which help build skills later in life. This has been the Kindness Warrior Podcast a Down Syndrome of Louisville production. To learn more about Down Syndrome of Louisville, visit our website, downsyndromeoflouisville.org. If you have questions or ideas, you can email us at kindnesswarriorpod at d-s-o-f-l-o-u dot org. The music for this episode was written and performed by Alex Stotts and Owen Eiler. The Kindness Warrior podcast is produced and edited by Ethan Holstein, produced and hosted by Carly Riggs. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. 